as brothers and sisters in Christ, manifest yourself in our lives today, we pray. Father, I thank you for your word, which never returns to you void, but always accomplishes the purpose for which you have sent it. Lord, please accomplish your purpose in our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, open your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of John. We will be beginning in chapter 1. Now, last week I introduced the Gospel of John to you and we sort of covered some background information pertaining to it. And we covered in a little more depth the first 18 verses of this chapter. And your reading assignment, for those of you that were here and, and remember your reading assignments, we've got the whole month of, of sermons mapped out on this card. It's at the back table with the calendar. Uh, your reading assignment for this particular uh, week was John chapter 1, verse 19 through John chapter 6, verse 71. And so our message today is going to be drawn from that text. Then, of course, uh, your uh, reading assignment for next week uh, will be John chapter 7, verse 1 through John chapter 12, verse 50. Uh, and our title today is The Word and His Witness. Now, of course, we know that when we say the word, we could be talking about the Bible because it is the word of God. But when we say the word, what we really mean within this context is Jesus Christ himself. For as we read in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Amen? Jesus Christ, pre-existent and eternal, one with the Father, created all that there is. In the beginning was the Word. And we know that everything that was made was made through Him and for Him. Amen? Amen. In verse 10, we read more of Him. And, and John writes, He was in the world. Why was He in the world? He was in the world because He became flesh and dwelt among us. Right? He was in the world because He laid aside His glory, humbled Himself, and took upon Himself the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men and submitted himself and humbled himself even to the point of death upon the cross. Amen? And so he was in the world, and as we've said, the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. They did not know him. He came to his own, the Jewish nation. He came to his own people in fulfillment of the scriptures. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Verse 18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And the previous verse tells us that, that the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. The law, which was given through Moses, reveals to us our need for a savior because none of us, not one of us can be made righteous by keeping the law. Not because the law is weak and not because the law is evil, but because we are weak and evil because there is none who does righteously. Not one, none of us are righteous before God. We've all fallen short, Romans taught us that, of the glory of God. And so none of us can be saved through the law. But the law is a schoolmaster that revealed to us our need for a savior, that demonstrated to us the fact that we are all in need of God's grace and mercy. And that grace, that 
truth came to us in the person of Jesus Christ and was given to us because of his death upon the cross, if only we will believe. Now, the title of our message today is The Word and His Witness. So, so let's look at one of the witnesses to Jesus Christ, to who Jesus was. In fact, this would perhaps be his first witness. Amen? A man named John the Baptist. And we read about him in John chapter 1, starting in verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. We learned three very important things here. Number one, he was a man. John was a man. He was a man who was descended from the Levitical line. He was a, a man whose father was a priest, and he himself could have become a priest serving in the temple. And yet we know that John was a prophet, that he lived in the wilderness, that he slept on the sand, and that camel's hair was what his garments were made of. We know that he ate locust and wild honey and, and was in appearance a rather odd figure. And he was a fiery preacher, preaching repentance to the nation of Israel. John was a man. But he was a man who had been sent by God. And l let me just say, when you are sent by God, it is not coincidental. When you are sent by God, it is not uh, haphazardly. When, when you are sent by God, it, it's not for no good reason. When you are sent by God, you're sent for a reason. When you're sent by God, you're sent for a purpose. And John was sent for a purpose. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness. That's why he came. He came to be a witness. He came. Now, what does a witness do? What does a witness do? A witness does at least two things. Maybe more, but at least two things. They do speak forth their testimony, right? But they also have to have a testimony to speak forth. In other words, to be a witness, you must witness something. So we think of John being a witness as he was witnessing to others about Christ. But what I want to suggest for you today, that he was actually sent for another reason not simply to proclaim a message, but to observe something. John was sent to see something. He was sent because there was something John was supposed to be looking for. He first had to witness it, and then he had to bear witness of it. Amen? And the same is true for you. You're called to be a witness. But before you can bear witness, you must have a witness to bear, right? You have to see something, you have to know something, you have to learn something in order to be able to share something. You, you can't give what you don't have. You, 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 you can't teach what you don't know, right? right? And so John was sent to bear witness, but he was also sent to be a witness. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light. In other words, John was not the Messiah, okay? But he was sent to bear witness of that light that was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. In verse 15, we read that John bore witness of him. John bore witness of Jesus, and he cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me. Now he didn't say that in this gospel, did he? He, he said that in the synoptic gospels. And in, in the other gospels, we read John saying this. But John, the writer of the apostle, is acknowledging that John the Baptist has said this before, right? That he who comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me. Now, we know if you look at the account in the Synoptic Gospels that John was actually about six months older than Jesus. So John was born before Jesus. So if John says he was before me, that is making a very clear statement that John knew and acknowledged that Jesus was a pre-existent being, that he existed before his birth. Amen? Amen? That he was in the beginning with God and that he was God. Amen? So 
John says, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. As we read before. Now, reading on into John's testimony, we read in verse 19. Now, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? <laughs> you see, tons of people were coming together to be baptized by John in the wilderness. They were coming and they were asking him, what, what do we have to do? And he's like giving them instructions as to how to repent and how to live a godly life. And, and people are just flocking to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes and the, and the priests, they were the gatekeepers of Israel, right? They were the ones who said, this is okay, that's not okay. This person is of God, this person is not of God. They were the, the ones who looked at something and said, mm, I don't know about that, right? I remember a revival that was going on a few years ago and there were lots of people who were interested in trying to decide whether or not that was a legitimate revival. And they're like, I don't know about that. You know what? People were calling out to Jesus. Amen. People were getting saved. People were worshiping God for days on end through song and praise. And you know what? Are things like that messy sometimes? Amen. Well, people are involved. So yeah. was everything that was done and everything that was said perfect? but were people pointed to God and did people come to faith in Jesus Christ? That, that excites me when I see stuff like that. But the Pharisee looks at it and says, ah, I don't know about that, right? And so they had sent people to inquire of John, essentially saying, by what authority are you doing this, right? Who, who exactly do you think you are? Now, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. It's like, I'm not trying to claim to be anything I'm not. I'm not claiming to be anyone I'm not. I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Because Elijah, it had been prophesied, would come as the forerunner of the Messiah. Now, John is saying, no, I'm not Elijah. But Jesus in the future would say that he came in the spirit of Elijah. Amen. So was he physically Elijah? No. But was he fulfilling the ministry of Elijah as the forerunner? Yes, he was. And they said, well, are you the prophet? Who are they talking about there? Moses had prophesied that a prophet would arise after him who would be like him. And in reality, Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophecy. It was another way of saying, are you the Messiah? And John says, no, nope, I told you already, I'm not the Messiah. So when they say, are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, well, who, who are you? <laughs> that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? So, I mean, you think about that. They're like, hey, who are you? He says, well, I'm not the Christ. And they're like, okay, fine. Are you, are you the prophet? No, I'm not the prophet. Why are we? So they had in their mind a list of titles that would have qualified him to do what he was doing. And when he did not meet any of their criteria, they were ready to shut him down. They were. It reminds me of when I first started uh, in the ministry back in 2003. We were, uh, we were meeting in a funeral home. That's where we met, in a funeral home. So look around. This place is an improvement because, for one, there are no dead bodies here. <laughs> I remember one Sunday, my, my oldest son, who was probably about oh, six at the time, probably five or six, he came to the Sunday school teacher and he said, ah, there's a dead body in there. <laughs> Kids are hilarious, aren't they? Man, this is a total aside. I should keep my finger in the text, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to drift aside. Yeah, I got to tell this story. It's not the one you think it is. It's okay. We, uh, we were on our way from the, you, you guys are just going to love this. This is so great. We, we, we were on our way from the pastor's conference, and we stopped for lunch at Chick-fil-A. And when we walked in, lo and behold, there was the youth pastor from Calvary Chapel Garland, was it? Is it Garland? Yeah. And uh, Tyler's his name. Tyler and his wife and their two little kids were there. And, uh, 
And so, hey, what are the odds, right? Coming home from a pastor's conference, you run into a pastor at a Chick-fil-A. I mean, that's, you know, that's where we were. And so we're talking with them, and we're talking about kids, and they started telling us a story about their oldest son. And they're like, you know, he goes in to the playground, and he's talking to just this kid that he's never met, and, and he goes up to him cold. And the first thing he says to this kid is, did you know they cut off John the Baptist's head? And then they used it for a trophy? I mean, how's that for, hello, do you want to play? At least you know what you're in for, right? Same kid, different story. He's out in the, the, like, the play area, and there's like this little creek that runs through it. And Tyler showed us the picture of this. And he's standing there by the edge of the creek. He's got a long stick, and he's putting the stick in the creek, and he's stirring the water. His teacher goes up to him, and she says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm trying to turn the water into blood. <laughs> I wonder what they're teaching in that Sunday school. It's some good stuff. But, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go back to the Bible now. <laughs> it's kind of related. I mean, John the Baptist is in this story, right? So they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Amen? In other words, he claimed to be there in fulfillment of the prophecy noted in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, which would have, or at least should have, set them on the alert for the coming of the Messiah. They should have been looking for the Messiah at this point because John had just claimed to be his forerunner. Now, those who were sent were from the Pharisees and they asked him, saying, well, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet? In other words, if you don't meet our criteria, then why are you baptizing? And so, as I was saying, we were at this funeral home, which is where we were meeting, right, as a church. And I remember after the first couple of Sundays, a gentleman walked up and he says, hey, pastor, it's good to talk to you. I'm glad to be here. I was just wondering, what seminary did you go to? And I looked at him and I said, well, I, 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 didn't, I didn't go to seminary. For those of you who are familiar with Calvary Chapel, let me tell you, Greg Laurie didn't go to seminary either. <laughs> Nor did Don, well, Don McClure might have actually. There are some of those guys who did go to seminary. Pastor Chuck went to seminary. But the vast majority of Calvary pastors, particularly in the first and second generation of Calvary Chapels, they didn't go to seminary. And a lot of the guys that, that, that are in ministry right now, we didn't go to seminary either. Do you know how we got into the ministry and were trained for the ministry? By doing ministry. By doing ministry. By sitting week after week after week in Bible study after Bible study after Bible study. And then by taking the things that we were learning and putting them into practice as we served the Lord and served his body. So I have a hard time answering that question because I realized that I did not meet this gentleman's criteria for what a minister was supposed to be. I don't wear suits either. I, don't, I mean, if, if you want to see me in a suit, get married or get buried. <laughs> and I'll be, I'll be in a suit for either one of those. But other than that, you're not usually going to see me wearing a suit because that's just, we are a blue collar kind of church. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I mean, those white collar types, they're welcome. If you're a lawyer or a doctor, praise the Lord for you. The offering box is right over there. I mean, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding, but it is really right over there. Um, we, we are, we, this is what happens when you send me to a pastor's conference. I come, I come with stories, okay, and, and with the word. And so I went to my pastor, Pastor Bill Quinn, and I was, I, was a young, I was a young guy, man. I was, I was like in my 30s, and, and that's young, right? Your thir that's, that, you don't, if, you're in, if you're in your 30s, you don't know how young you are. You are young, right? I was in my 30s. I was a young guy. I didn't know what I didn't know. And I went to my pastor, Pastor Bill, and I said, hey, Pastor Bill, this guy asked me this question the other day, and I felt, kind of felt like I was on the spot, you know? Because I'm, I'm ordained, actually, from Calvary Chapel, Fort Worth, and I also hold an ordination from Calvary Chapel, Las Cruces, New Mexico. 
uh, where I had served for four years at one of them and for four years at another. And, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm going to my pastor and I'm like, how, how, how do I answer this question? How do I explain this to this person? And Pastor Bill looks at me with that Clint Eastwood look that he has. If you know him, you, if you know, you know, right? And he says, the next time someone asks you that, you tell them you went to Bush Seminary. And I said, Bush Seminary? What's that? He says, it's the same one that Moses went to. All right. Not that I've seen burning bushes, right? But God calls people into service. And when God calls people into service, God equips people for service. John's authority to baptize didn't come because he was the Christ. John's authority to baptize didn't come because he was Elijah. John's baptism or John's right to baptize didn't come because he was the prophet. John's right to baptize came from the fact that God sent him to do it. Amen. That's where it came from. Your authority to witness, your authority to bear witness, your authority to share the gospel comes from the fact that God has called you to do it. Did you know, I'm going to tell you something that you didn't even know. Did you know you don't have to be a pastor to baptize somebody? <gasps> How dare I say that in the South? Did you know that any believer in Jesus Christ who is walking with Jesus Christ, if they witness to somebody and that someone says, hey, why shouldn't I be baptized right now? You could baptize them in your backyard swimming pool. You can. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a prophet and you are a priest of the Lord Most High. You are called into ministry by the mere fact that you are a follower of Jesus. Amen. Hmm. John answered them, verse 26, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you who you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. Now these things were done in Bethsaida beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. And the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen? Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world of the world. This was speaking of Jesus as the Passover lamb. We're headed towards Resurrection Sunday. The last sermon in our five-part series here is called From Golgotha to Glory. Amen? And that was the day upon which Jesus became the sacrifice for our sins. When his blood was shed upon the cross, he was, in essence, the Passover lamb that was foretold through the Passover every year when they celebrated it in Jerusalem. So the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. In other words, the entire reason that I came baptizing with water was because I was looking for something to be revealed to me. I was looking, can you imagine every time John lowers someone before the water, as he brings them up out of the water, he's like looking, is it happening yet? Is this the one? Can you imagine the anticipation that John must have felt baptism after baptism after baptism because that is why he came baptizing. He was waiting to see something every single time. And John bore witness saying, I saw the spirits descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, so the Lord said to John as he's saying, you're going to go baptize people with water and I want you to be on the lookout, John, because here's what you're going to see. Upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And here's John's witness right here. This is it. I have seen and testified that this is the son of God. Amen. John is saying, I have seen it. And I've testified it. I've seen it. You have to see it before you can testify it, right? You have to know it before you can show it. I've seen it and I testify that this is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. And again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold the Lamb of God. Amen? Amen. This was John's testimony. John's entire purpose 
was summed up in this. That's him. That's him. Amen. Now, if you read your reading assignment, then you know that after this, we see a number of things. In chapter one, we see disciples called to follow Jesus as his first disciples begin to follow him. In chapter two, we see a wedding feast. Amen. And we see Jesus cleansing the temple. It was at that wedding feast that he performed the first of his miraculous signs, the transformation of water into wine. We're going to talk more about that and the other signs in a little while. Um, in verse 3, or chapter 3 rather, in chapter 3, we see a conversation that he has with a man named Nicodemus. We're going to take a closer look at that in a moment or two as well. In chapter 4, we see him having a conversation with a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman at the well, and we see the healing of the nobleman's son. In chapter 5, we see a paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda who is made whole and who as a result of, of his healing is told by Jesus to take up his bed and walk. But the problem was this happened on a Sabbath day and the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests, they took issue with the fact that this man was carrying his bed on a Sabbath day and it created a moment of conflict that we're going to read about in a moment. And then of course in chapter six, we see the miraculous sign of the feeding of the 5,000 and we see also Jesus walking upon the water and calming the storm. Turn with me, if you will, for a closer look at John chapter 5. Now, as you know, normally we like to teach chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but in this series, as we do this survey of John, I'm having to skip way more than I would like to because we just don't have that much time, unless we want to turn today into a conference and I get to teach three or four messages and then we can do that again next week and we'll be good. But no, I'm going to let you go after this because we didn't tell you we were going to do that. So here in John chapter five, we read in verse one, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches, and in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at certain times into the pool and stirred up the water. And then whoever stepped in, the, in first, then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. It's a long time to be sick, isn't it? And when Jesus... When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Now that's a great question, isn't it? If I were teaching just this passage, I would really camp out on that question. And I'd ask you the question, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well from the trials and the tribulations that you face? Do you want to be made well from the sicknesses that you face? Do you want to be made well from the habitual sins that you find yourself prey to? Do you want to be made well? Or do you want to persist in your present condition? Because sometimes people prefer to persist in their present condition, don't they? Sometimes people don't want to be made well. Sometimes people don't want to give up their pet sin or their pet problem. But Jesus asks this man, do you want to be made well? And rather than saying, yes, I want to be made well, the man begins to do what we so often do, which is offer excuses for why he hasn't yet been made well. The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. It's not about the pool. You don't need to get in the water. You need to have faith in me. You need to listen to what I'm telling you and, and obey. Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and he walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Now, of course, the law says you're not to do any work on the Sabbath day. And that's true. That's the law of God. But the Jewish people had added so many explanations for what work was that they had made it almost impossible to keep this law. And he had taken up his bed and he was walking with it and that was, according to the Jews, a violation of the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, 
It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Not, whoa, dude, you're walking. But rather, why are you carrying your bed? Don't you know it's the Sabbath? He answered to them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. And then they asked him, Well, who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had, Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. So Jesus had just melted into the crowd, right? Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. How's that for keeping the law, right? I think there's definitely one about honoring the Sabbath day to keep it holy, but I also seem to remember something about not killing people, right? But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath. Now, did Jesus actually break the Sabbath? He broke their interpretation of the Sabbath because their interpretation of the Sabbath was wrong. He not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So his enemies knew exactly what he meant when he said, my father has been working until now, right? They knew he was claiming to be the son of God, making himself equal with God. They understood what he was saying. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, and this is important, y'all. This is, this is where we're getting into the true witness of the word. The son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do, for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. So Jesus is saying, you're passing judgment on me, but you need to understand that there is not a thing that I'm doing that I haven't seen the father doing. I am doing as the Father does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these. In other words, you ain't seen nothing yet that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. And he was going to prove this before very long. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son so that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. If you disrespect a messenger, you are disrespecting the one who sent that messenger. If I say to my daughter, go upstairs and tell your brother, I said to come downstairs and wash the dishes. And when she goes up and she says to her brother, dad said you need to come down and wash the dishes, and he yells at her and says, I'm not doing that. Is he disrespecting her or is he disrespecting me? The answer is both. He's disrespecting me by disrespecting her, right? Because she didn't come of her own accord. She wasn't bringing her own, own message. She came because I sent her and she was acting under my authority, right? And Jesus was acting under the authority of the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus was the Son of God, fully God, and he was the son of man, fully man. And he could lay his hands upon both and bring the two together through his cross. Amen? Yeah. To reconcile us to God. Verse 28 says, do not marvel at this. In other words, don't be amazed at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear the voice of God, will hear his voice, and they will come forth. Those who have done good to a resurrection of life those who have done evil to a resurrection of condemnation. Praise God that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
So those who are not in Christ Jesus are already condemned. Those who are in Christ Jesus will never be condemned. Do you want to be condemned? Reject Christ. Do you want to escape condemnation? Embrace Christ. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Now, verse 31 and everything that follows is very interesting because this is going to talk about the testimony that bears witness to who Christ is, okay? We talk about the word and his witness. We talked about John being a witness, but now we see the witness, amen? If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me. Now, you might be thinking that that other one that he's talking about is John the Baptist, but it isn't. When Jesus says there is another who bears witness of me, he is not talking about John the Baptist. He recognizes that someone might mistakenly think that's what he meant, and he addresses it here in the next few verses. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. In other words, John's testimony is true. Yet I do not receive testimony from man. But I say these things that you may be saved. In other words, listen, yes, John bore witness of me and his witness is true. He was right. But I don't need the witness of John. I have a greater witness than John. He was, speaking of John, a burning and shining lamp and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Jesus said, I don't need the testimony of man. Look at what I'm doing. I am not doing this through my own agency. I am doing this as an extension of the work of the Father. The fact that I am doing these things is God's seal of approval on my message. If I was not of God, I couldn't do these things. But because I am of God and I am doing these things, you should believe the testimony. He goes on to say, And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me through John the Baptist. And you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen him, but you do have his word. He's like, you know what? You have the scriptures. You have the written word of God. And that also bears witness of me. You do not have his word. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. They had the scriptures, but they did not have the scriptures abiding in them. You do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent, you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. You see, they thought that eternal life was in the scriptures. They thought that eternal life was in the Bible. You know what? Sometimes we make that same mistake. We need to remember that the purpose of reading the Bible is not to know the Bible. The purpose of reading the Bible is to know Jesus. That's the purpose. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these, the scriptures, are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? In other words, if you don't believe the scriptures, how are you going to believe what I'm telling you about myself? And I can say the same thing to you this morning. If you don't believe the Bible, how are you ever going to believe anything I say to you about the Bible? If, if you don't believe the word of God, how can I ever convince you that the words in this book are true? Jesus had a testimony, not only from John, 
but from the Father himself. And the Father bore witness of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Father bore witness that Jesus was in fact the Messiah through the works that Jesus did, through the testimony of John as he had seen the Spirit descending from heaven and resting upon him and remaining upon him, and through the miraculous works that Jesus did and through the scriptures, through the testimony of scriptures and the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Amen? Now, the works that Jesus did are numerous and abundant. And in John chapter 20, John points out that Jesus did many other signs, verse 30, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these, that is the signs that are written in this book, are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Amen? Amen. There are essentially seven signs that we see presented to us throughout the Gospel of John. Jesus did many other signs, but there are seven that John's Gospel focuses on, and these are given to us so that we might believe, and that believing we could have life in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. They are found in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, where he turned the water into wine. Warren Wiersbe has broken these down in a really beautiful way. I'm just going to share with you what he said. This sign shows us that salvation is by the word of God. For water is symbolized by the word. And when our clay pot bodies are filled with the water of the word of God, he transforms it into the wine of his joy in his spirit. Amen? Amen. Now, the second sign is found in John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54, which is the healing of the nobleman's son, which teaches us that salvation is by faith. The third is the healing of the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda, which we read about today in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, which so, shows us that salvation is by grace. This man wasn't healed because he got into the pool. This man wasn't healed because somebody else put him in the pool. This man was healed because Jesus said, rise up and walk. Amen. Unmerited favor, undeserved grace, right? That is, is a symbol of the fact that salvation is by grace. These first three show us the, the means of salvation. Salvation comes through the word, through faith, and through grace. And the last four show us the results of salvation in the life of a believer. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, which we should have read this past week, we see the feeding of the 5,000, which shows us that salvation brings satisfaction. Amen? Salvation satisfies our deepest hunger. In John chapter 6, the last half of that chapter, verses 16 through 21 specifically, we see Jesus walking upon the water, and the moment he enters the boat, they reach the opposite shore, having brought them through the storm. And salvation, this teaches us, brings peace. Amen? The next one is in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, the healing of the blind man, and it shows us that salvation brings light. I once was blind but now I see. Amen? Amazing grace. And then the last of the signs in the book of John is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. John chapter 11, verses 38 through 45. You'll probably read that this week. Yes, you'll read that this week. And that teaches us that salvation brings life. Amen? And so these works, these signs, bear witness to who Jesus is. And what's more, the Pharisees and the priests and the scribes, they actually, though they denied it, recognized the validity of this witness. How do we know that? We know it from John chapter 3. Go ahead and turn there with me as we close. In John chapter 3, we see an incredible encounter with a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, meaning a member of the Sanhedrin. And this man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. We know you come from God. We know that God has endorsed your ministry. We know it. How do we know it? For no one can do these signs that you do 
unless God is with him. Amen? The works bore witness to the word. Amen? The things that Jesus did as he was on this earth, right? They bore witness to who he truly was. And the greatest of his works was his willingness to bleed and die upon the cross to pay the price for your sins and mine. That he was buried and that on the third day he rose from the grave, bringing to us the promise not only of the forgiveness of our sins, but of the free gift of eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. People say, oh, I don't like Christians. You know, they're just condemning. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. God sent his son into the world that the world might be saved through him. Amen? He who believes in him she who believes in him, you who believe in him, you are not condemned. But the one who does not believe is condemned already. You see, God didn't need to condemn us. We were already condemned. He came to save us from that condemnation. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. In other words, he has not believed the witness of the scriptures. He has not believed the witness of the signs that Jesus performed. He has not believed the witness of the resurrection, ultimately meaning he has not believed the witness of God. If you reject Jesus Christ, what you are saying is you don't believe God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world but men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. Do we see this in the world today? The light of Jesus Christ, the testimony of Jesus Christ, the word of God is hated in the world today because their deeds are evil. But he who does the truth, in other words, he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He who receives the testimony of the Scripture, he who acknowledges Christ's death, burial, and resurrection as the only Son of God who bled and died for our sins, he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise your name. Lord, we receive the testimony of this word. We receive, Lord, the testimony of the Father. Thank you for sending John the Baptist. Thank you for sending the signs and wonders that were wrought by Jesus. Thank you for sending the scriptures that we might read about your son in them and know him. Lord, we search the scriptures for in them we find Jesus. For they are the ones that testify of him. Lord, help us to receive this testimony. Help us to believe this testimony. Overcome our doubts. Overcome our fears. Overcome our desire for sin. And help us, Lord, to truly long to be healed. As every eye is closed, as every head is bowed, I'm going to do something that I don't always do today, but I want to give you that opportunity to just say, you know what? I need Jesus. I need to receive this testimony and to believe in the only begotten Son of God. I need to submit my life to God through Jesus Christ this morning. If you're here today or if you're watching online and you have never truly submitted your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've believed in him in a very intellectual way, but you've never submitted yourself to him. You've never committed yourself to following him. You've never truly believed and you want to believe this morning. You want to express your belief. You want to know that you know that you know that you have been born again. 
if you want to escape the condemnation that is in this book for those who have rejected him, if you want to confirm that relationship that you have with God in Jesus Christ and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. I'm going to ask you very simply just to lift your hand to the Lord. Raising your hand isn't what saves you, right? Faith in Jesus Christ is what saves you. By raising your hand, you're making a public declaration. I choose to follow Jesus. I choose to believe in Jesus. I acknowledge Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Lord, you see the hands that have been raised. Lord, you know the hearts that moved those hands. Lord, you know the fears and the doubts and all of the struggles that we face. You know the sin that so easily besets us. And yet you, Lord, hmm, you demonstrated your love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm going to ask the entire congregation, those who believe in Jesus Christ, to pray aloud with me. And those of you who lifted your hand for the first time, we are praying with you right now. We are praying for you and we are praying with you. And I want you to just speak these words aloud and pray with us as we acknowledge the Father and his Son. Pray with me, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying for my sins. Father, I believe in the testimony of your word. I believe in the miraculous signs and wonders that Jesus performed. I receive your testimony. Lord, I acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he died for my sins. And that on the third day he rose from the grave. I confess my sin to you. I confess my need for you. I submit my life to you. Be my Lord and Savior. Send your Holy Spirit to live in my heart. And just as John the Baptist was, Make me a witness for you. Live in me. Forgive me for my sins. And help me to live my life for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's worship the Lord together. If you need prayer, I'll be in the back to pray.